Seth said, I'm Prashanti Gandham. I'm one of your friendly local pediatric endocrinologists. And today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about pediatric metabolic bone disease. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so I have, first of all, no financial disclosures. The objectives of my talk today are, are to review basic anatomy and physiology of bone, as well as briefly that of calcium homeostasis, to review common pediatric bone disorders, to review risk factors for bone disease in children, and to discuss known and briefly emerging therapies for pediatric bone disease. So bone is really much more than just a foundation that provides mechanical support to the body. Rather, um, it should be and is, um, should be considered and is a highly specialized dynamic connective tissue. So in addition to serving as the body's major reservoir of calcium and phosphorus, it has recently come to be recognized as a true endocrine organ. So in that capacity, bone plays major roles in renal phosphate handling, as well as in glucose metabolism, via its production of hormones, including FGF23 and osteocalcin. I want to take a minute to just kind of review um, a little bit of anatomy and physiology, maybe go back to our medical school days. So the long bones are made up of three anatomic regions, which include the shaft or the diaphysis of the bone, the metaphysis, which includes the epiphyseal or the growth plate, and then the actual epiphysis, which is the rounded end of the bone um, that forms the articular surface. In growing children, the growth plate consists of a layer of hyaline cartilage, which is the site of endochondral bone formation and which is what allows for long bone growth during childhood. At a macroscopic level, we can break bone down into either cortical or trabecular bone, and trabecular bone is sometimes also called cancellous or spongy bone. Um, the vast majority of our skeleton is made up of cortical bone, so maybe about 85% of the skeleton, um, and cortical bone is typically found in the shaft of long bone, um, and can be found surrounding trabecular bone as well. It tends to be much denser than trabecular bone. Trabecular bone, by contrast, is found at the end of long bones in the vertebrae and in the flat bones, such as um, seen in the pelvis or in the, in the skull. Um, trabecular bone has a much higher degree of porosity. Um, and as you all know, uh, we learn in medical school all the time that form and function are generally linked. And so we see that cortical bone tends to function mainly as a mechanical support, while the trabecular bone is highly metabolically active and serves as the major site of hematopoiesis. No, sorry. Um, at the microscopic level, cortical bone is composed of osteons. Um, each individual osteon contains a central highly vascular canal, which supplies the bone with its blood supply, and it's called the haversion canal. And then each individual haversion canal is surrounded by concentric lamellae. Um, these lamellae, lamellae consist of bundles of collagen fibrils, which are arranged in a plywood pattern. And what's really interesting is that um, the neighboring lamellae are all arranged in a different fibril pattern. And so you have sort of an alternating plywood, plywood arrangement, and that's really what gives bone its strength. Um, and, you know, I mentioned briefly that bone is really a dynamic tissue. Um, and so in that regard, there's constantly new tissue, new bone tissue that's being formed. And old or damaged bone is constantly being resorbed. This process is called remodeling and it occurs throughout life. I um, mean, it's a tightly coupled process in terms of the amount of bone formation and the amount of bone resorption that is uh, occurring at any given point. Um, by contrast, in childhood, there's another process that occurs, which is called modeling, um, and this only occurs uh, while uh, the epiphyseal plates remain open, um, and uh, it um, occurs by the process of uncoupled bone formation and bone resorption, um, and modeling is what allows for endochondral ossification and long bone growth at the growth plate. Um, what's really allowing bones to have these various functions are um, a number of different bone cell types. Um, so they are what allow for modeling versus remodeling of bone. So you can see um, this round purple cell um, on, on the picture, which is the osteoblast. And the osteoblast is responsible for new bone formation. 
And what they do, osteoblasts, is synthesize and secrete and secrete a bony matrix as well as calcium salts. And as the matrix surrounding each osteoblast begins to calcify, the osteoblast becomes trapped within the matrix. Um, and this induces both a functional and a morphologic change. Um, the osteoblasts become osteocytes, which are these little star-shaped cells that you see within the matrix. Um, and really, the, the function of osteocytes is to maintain the mineral concentration of the, uh, of the matrix. Um, in contrast, you have osteoclasts, which are these little red mushroom-shaped cells, and they are responsible for bony resorption. Um, and so what this constant remodeling of bone allows for is not only to correct any microstructural damage that exists in the bone, but also it allows for a very subtle um, but a constant reshaping of bones throughout life. And then briefly, I just want to review um, calcium metabolism. So when we have a low serum calcium level, um, the parathyroid glands are able to recognize this and they will increase the secretion of parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone has a number of effects. It acts directly on bone um, to increase osteoclast function, increase bone resorption, and um, therefore increase calcium release into the serum. PTH also acts on the kidneys to upregulate 1-alpha hydroxylase, which is an enzyme that converts calcidiol which is 25-hydroxyvitamin D, or the storage form of vitamin D stored in the liver, to calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D. Um, calcitriol will also act directly on bone to increase calcium release, um, but it also has effects in the gut to increase the um, absorption of calcium in our gut uh, from the food that we eat. And so the net effect of all of these um, changes is really to increase serum calcium, and we also see a net decrease in serum phosphorus, uh, phosphorus levels uh, due to PTH increases. So in this next phase of the talk, we're going to start talking about a little bit, a little bit more about pathophysiology, and we're going to begin with a discussion of rickets. Um, I think it's always interesting to, to sort of get a historical perspective and understand where we've been, where we've come from as far as the disease processes and management. Um, so we're going to take a quick look back. Um, autopsy studies that were conducted in Boston, as well as in the Netherlands in the late 19th century, demonstrated that about 80 to 90 percent of children um, had rickets at that time, which is really an astounding number. In 1822, Sniadecki recognized that children um, with, ricket, with rickets were able to um, have a curative effect if they were exposed to the sun, and he also recognized that sun exposure um, had preventive uh, effects for rickets as well. Almost 100 years later, Malambi et al. was able to prevent rickets in puppies by supplementing them with cod liver oil. Um, and then finally, in 1922, McCollum et al. were able to isolate and give a name to this nutritional factor that was so important for the management of rickets, um, and they named it vitamin D. But it really wasn't until the 1930s when vitamin D was able to be synthesized from yeast in sort of a large-scale process and inexpensively that we started to see um, major gains in terms of our, our available treatments for our prevention really of rickets. So in the 1930s, they began to fortify milk with vitamin D, and that's when the incidence um, of rickets in developing or developed nations began to decline. So what exactly is rickets, um, and how does it differ from osteomalacia if it differs at all? So rickets is defined as deficient mineralization of the growth plate versus um, osteomalacia, which is defined as deficient mineralization of the bony matrix as a whole. In general, rickets and osteomalacia will occur together as long as the growth plates are remaining open. Once you have epiphyseal fusion, on the other hand, only osteomalacia occurs. And so in adults, for instance, we do see osteomalacia, but by definition, rickets cannot occur in an adult. Um, the major problems of rickets in childhood are really growth retardation and then bone deformity, um, whereas adult counterparts with osteomalacia will gen generally present with muscle weakness as well as bone pain. Um, the overall incidence of rickets is unknown, both in the United States and worldwide um, in general. But interestingly, it is thought to be increasing worldwide um, again. Um, and that's true even in developed nations, 
We're not 100% sure why that is, but one of the theories is that um, with increased um, concern for skin cancer, a lot more people are, are wearing sunscreen, and so they're just not getting the sun exposure that they used to get. Um, rickets can be broken up into either calcipenic or phospopenic rickets, um, but the most common cause of rickets worldwide is vitamin D deficient rickets, which is also known as nutritional rickets. And that's really what the majority of the rest of our talk um, on rickets is going to focus on. So um, as discussed on the previous slide, rickets can be broken up into calcipenic or phospopenic rickets. Um, we mentioned that nutritional rickets or vitamin D deficient rickets is the most common cause of rickets. Um, much more rarely, you can have rickets even from just a dietary calcium deficiency, um, but there are also genetic conditions that can cause a calcipenic rickets picture. Um, and these include one alpha hydroxylase deficiency, which used to be known as vitamin D dependent uh, rickets, and then vitamin D receptor defects or mutations. So one alpha hydroxylase again is the enzyme which converts the storage form of vitamin D to calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D. And then obviously when you have a vitamin D receptor defect, though you might have normal levels and you do have normal levels of vitamin D, um, the storage in the active forms, you're not able to, to respond to the vitamin D. In terms of phospopenic rickets, this, in, this can occur due to renal tubular disorders such as Fanconi syndrome. Um, the most common cause of isolated renal phosphate loss um, and the most common heritable cause of rickets, phosphopenic rickets, however, is X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. Um, so this is caused by mutations in the FEX gene, and this results in an FGF23-mediated hypophosphatemia. There are also autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive forms of FGF23-mediated hypophosphatemic rickets, but they are much more rare. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to go over some of the skeletal findings that we see in rickets. Um, so we oftentimes will see in our younger children delayed closure of the fontanelles. There's oftentimes parietal and frontal bossing. Um, you can see here on the uh, top left picture, there's a widening and a fraying of the metaphyses that occurs. Um, craniotabes is a softening of the skull, and you can see um, with that finger pressed into the skull, what's called a ping pong defect that occurs as a result of craniotabes. Rachitic rose, the rachitic, rachitic rose ring, I'm sorry, occurs because of an enlargement of the costochondral junction. Um, we have the Harrison group, which is caused by the softened lower ribs being pulled inwards by diaphragmatic attachments. Um, bowed limbs is extremely common in rickets. Um, and then in this final picture right here in the bottom middle, you can see something called a looser zone. So looser zones are considered um, a characteristic, almost pathognomonic radiologic finding in osteomalacia. And what they are are pseudofractures, um, and they're visualized on, radiogra on radiographs as a very thin radiolucent line with thick and sclerotic borders. So children who are affected by rickets will oftentimes present with pain, uh, or in younger children who aren't really able to vocalize what they're feeling, maybe just irritability or um, being difficult to console. Muscle weakness and decreased muscle tone are very common. Um, and you can actually have uh, delayed achievement of motor milestones or even an antalgic gait due to this weakness and decrease in tone. Poor growth is common. We also see um, a downward displacement of the abdominal uh, viscera, which is called visceroptesis, and that is what causes sort of that typical pot belly appearance of children who gets. Um, and certainly in vitamin D deficient or nutritional rickets, you can have symptomatic hypocalcemia um, with numbness, tingling, QT prolongation on EKG, um, and then hypocalcemic seizure. Hypocalcemic seizure does occur most commonly in the first year of life, um, but it can happen really at any age. Um, and then lab abnormalities that we would expect in calcipenic rickets in general would be either a low or normal calcium level, low phosphorus levels, an elevated PTH, which is an appropriate, sec an appropriate secondary response to the low calcium and the low vitamin D. Um, and then we see elevations in alkaline phosphatase as well. So what are the risk factors for vitamin D deficiency? What can we do to prevent rickets? Um, 
actually, we know that maternal transfer of vitamin D occur across the placenta, um, and the most critical time uh, that this occurs is in the third trimester. Um, and so uh, prematurity certainly is a risk factor for vitamin D deficiency. Breast milk tends to have a very, very low amount, uh, low content of uh, vitamin D, about 50, 50 IUs per liter. Um, even a vitamin D replete mother. So we all know that if you have an exclusively breastfed infant, um, if they're not being appropriately supplemented with vitamin D, they're at high risk for vitamin D deficiency and rickets. Um, just in general, there are very few foods that naturally contain um, a, a high amount of vitamin D, but the foods that do contain vitamin D tend to be either fish or meat-based um, foods. And so oftentimes vegetarians or vegans can be at a slightly higher risk for vitamin D deficiency. Um, if you have um, a vegetarian who does consume dairy products, then drinking fortified milk can certainly be beneficial. Of course, we know that individuals with darker skin tones oftentimes will need um, longer exposure or more exposure to, to sunlight and UV radiation to get adequate um, vitamin D production. Um, but in general, anybody who has inadequate sun exposure, no matter for what reason, is at high risk. Um, and obesity is certainly um, a risk factor just because vitamin D tends to get sequestered in, in fatty tissue. Um, and the malabsorbed orders or renal and liver disease are also implicated. So the treatment of nutritional rickets obviously hinges on vitamin D replacement. Um, and the dosing for replacement depends on a child's age. So traditional dosing schemas um, talk about giving it a daily replacement over, a, over several months. But if you have patients who you feel um, might struggle with compliance in terms of taking a medication daily for an extended period of time, there is an alternative which is called STAS therapy. And that involves giving one single very high dose of uh, vitamin D, and that again um, is dependent on age. Um, STAS therapy should not be used in infants less than three months old, um, but um, if you have an infant who's three months or older or older children and adolescents, then this is certainly um, an option that can be used. Once uh, main, or I'm sorry, once therapy has been completed, then it's very important to transition children from therapeutic regimens to a maintenance dosing regimen. So for infants, 400 IU of vitamin D daily would be considered maintenance dosing. And then in older children and adolescents, anywhere from 600 to 1,000 IU daily. Um, we do oftentimes um, also replace calcium in the early stages of treatment, and this is mainly to prevent what's called the hungry bone syndrome. So when you have longstanding rickets um, and an elevated PTH level, um, you're essentially stimulating bone uh, resorption to, to occur continuously, and the bone is really being depleted of its, of its calcium. Um, and so when you begin treatment, the bones are just so hungry to sort of replenish their calcium stores that they will take up all of the available calcium. Um, and so if you don't provide calcium replacement in the initial phases, then you can actually precipitate um, a, an acute hypocalcemic event. Um, as far as the treatment duration, typically we would expect resolution of rickets within three months of therapy. In general, though, skeletal healing is going to be delayed compared to biochemical resolution. And so um, it's important to check labs within a month of starting therapy. By this point, the acute hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia should have resolved, um, and the alkaline phosphatase level should really be trending downward, um, if not completely normalized. Um, and then you would check labs monthly, at least, until you have complete biochemical resolution of the rickets. Um, and then at three months, if your labs have analyzed, it would be completely reasonable to obtain radiographs just to ensure there's been skeletal healing. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about osteoporosis in children. So osteoporosis is defined as low bone mineral density with alterations in the microarchitecture of bone, increased bone fragility, and greater fracture risk. Um, now in adults, bone mineral density has been shown to be a very reliable predictor of fracture risk. And we see in adults that each decrease in the bone mineral density of one standard deviation below the average value for sex matched adults um, would result in approximately uh, a doubling of fracture risk. 
And so in adults, we're able to come up with, with a very simple definition of osteoporosis, which is based on BMD alone um, and consists of a T-score of less than minus 2.5 standard deviations. Now in the pediatric world, we know that kids are not just miniature adults. And so what we see is that the clinical relevance of uncomplicated low bone mineral density in children remains difficult to evaluate. And we still don't fully understand what, if any, um, complications can arise from just isolated low bone mineral density in an otherwise healthy child. Furthermore, there's not really any concrete evidence that we have that a low BMD by itself is a predictor of fracture risk in growing children. Um, so we know that children are accruing bone mass throughout childhood, and you're continuing to accrue bone mass in your early adulthood years, so you're not really reaching peak bone mass until maybe your late 20s. And so because of that, there's not really any one normal BMD value that we can rely on um, as a comparative factor in children. So essentially, T-scores are, um, are, are not very useful in the pediatric population. So age, pubertal status, gender, um, a child's size or stature, their ethnicity, all of these things can certainly um, play a role um, in, in bone mineral density norms. So the index that we use in, in children is different, and it's called the Z-score. Um, and it's really important to ensure that the Z-score um, that you're obtaining on your DEXA measurements um, are corrected values um, in order for them to be accurate. So where does that leave us? Given the difficulties in obtaining an accurate um, densitometric data in children, and given that BMD by itself may not be a reliable predictor, predictor of fractures in children, there's not really a clear consensus right now on a diagnosis of osteoporosis in children based solely on bone mineral density. And so the diagnosis really hinges on having not only a low BMD, but having a clinically significant history of fracture. Um, and what we've translated to um, is having a BMD Z-score of less than or equal to minus two standard deviations and either two long bone fractures by the age of 10 or three long bone fractures by the age of 19 or if you have the presence of vertebral compression or crush fractures that have been sustained in the absence of traumatic injury, um, that would be sort of on its own um, would, would give the child a diagnosis of osteoporosis. I think it's important to note that um, this definition of osteoporosis in children is really um, based upon expert opinion as opposed to hard data. And so there's still a lot of ongoing debate about what the definition should be, and it's probably subject to change um, in the future as we continue to learn more. So in regards to measuring bone mineral density, certainly the most widely used measure is gonna be the DEXA scan, which provides low radiation dose, is widely available, um, and it has good precision. The, the concept with that is that DEXA is not really a volumetric measure of bone mineral density. What it does is it measures aerial bone density, and the reason that this can kind of complicate factors is because aerial bone density is highly dependent on the size of bones, and so it can certainly um, overestimate density in large bones and underestimate the density in small bones, and so we have to make sure in order to get an accurate DEXA measurement in children specifically, uh, make sure that we're correcting z-scores for height. Um, and CHOP actually has an online calculator that's uh, widely available um, that we can use to make sure we have appropriate z-scores. There are alternatives to DEXA, such as the quantitative CT, and this does provide a volumetric measure of bone density, but certainly it's more expensive, less widely available, um, and it, it uh, causes a much higher radiation exposure than DEXA. Um, and so there's no concrete recommendations um, to use quantitative CT over DEXA at this time. So what causes osteoporosis in children? Um, osteoporosis can be due to either primary causes or more commonly secondary causes. Um, the most common primary cause of osteoporosis is osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a, con a connective tissue disorder that we're going to talk about a little bit more later on in the talk. Um, and there's also an entity that's called juvenile idiopathic osteoporosis. This is considered a diagnosis of exclusion, but the interesting thing about JIO is that it often will remit on its own um, once a child has gone through puberty. As far as the secondary causes, this could include endocrinopathies such as um, 
endogenous Cushing's disease, hyperthyroidism, hypogonadism, chronic immobilization is certainly a significant risk factor. So we see this, of course, in children with uh, cerebral palsy or the neuromuscular disorders like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, any inflammatory disorder, you know, JIA or inflammatory bowel disease, malabsorptive conditions like cystic fibrosis, um, malignancy for sure, anorexia nervosa, and then of course there's also iatrogenic um, secondary osteoporosis due to agents like anticonvulsant, methotrexate, and then by and far the most common cause of secondary osteoporosis in children and likely in adults is um, glucocorticoid therapy. So the clinical manifestations of osteoporosis in children are really fractures, um, and this can be either non-vertebral fractures or vertebral fractures. The most common sites for um, a low trauma, uh, a low trauma non-vertebral fractures would be the humerus, tibia, and the forearm. Hip fractures are very rare in children with osteoporosis. If they occur, then it's important to look for another underlying cause, which most commonly is a malignancy, but certainly uh, a primary fibrous dysplasia of the hip could um, could also be a cause. And then I think it's important, again, to be aware of those looser zones that we talked about earlier, which, if present, are indicative of osteomalacia um, rather than osteoporosis and should really prompt a workup for rickets. As far as vertebral fractures are concerned, they're likely um, highly un under-recognized in children. And this is for multiple reasons, one of which is that children are oftentimes asymptomatic. Um, and so bone pain is not always, or back pain is not always, pre always present in a child with a vertebral fracture. And we probably don't screen at-risk children quite as often with spine radiographs as we should. The prevalence of vertebral fractures varies according to um, the underlying disease process. So we see that children with glucocorticoid therapy um, have the highest prevalence of vertebral fractures, um, up to about 32%. And then children with motor disabilities also have a relatively high prevalence of vertebral fractures um, of about 25% or so. So it's very important uh, to make a, a prompt diagnosis of, diagnosis of vertebral fracture because again, the presence of um, a low trauma vertebral fracture is an independent indication for the initiation of medical therapy. So how should we evaluate children who are either at risk for osteoporosis or her individuals who are presenting to us with history of recurrent fracture? So in at-risk individuals, um, paramount, of course, is going to be history and physical exams. So getting a good dietary history, ensuring that children are getting the appropriate recommended daily intake of calcium, which varies by age, um, screening for vitamin D deficiency and supplementing them appropriately if um, vitamin D deficiency is or insufficiency is identified. And then just getting a really, really good fracture history. So asking about any back pain, bone pain, lung bone pain, falls, um, and then getting radiographs if there's any clinical concern whatsoever for um, fracture. And individuals with no particular risk factors um, who are presenting with recurrent fracture, then the number one priority is going to be to rule out a secondary cause of osteoporosis. So this will involve screening for abnormal thyroid function, um, the, for PTH calcium FOS abnormalities, of course, vitamin D studies. Um, and then depending on a child's particular presentation, you might screen for inflammatory disorders or hypogonadism um, and so on and so forth. Um, it's important to look at the growth chart and assess children's growth and do a good physical exam, looking for any features that might give you a clue um, that there is an underlying hair level condition. So looking for blue sclera or, or hypermobility, looking at body proportions. Um, any child who we know is going to be started on glucocorticoid therapy and going to be on therapy for at least three months should probably be considered at the very least for um, baseline spinal films or a DEXA scan. And then if they're going to remain on this high-risk therapy for um, an extended duration of time, then probably follow-up imaging should be done on a yearly basis. And then in children who have impaired mobility, screening spine radiographs should be completed at least um, by six to eight years at the latest, um, and then every one to two years until linear growth has been completed. 
Um, again, there is no um, one consensus, great consensus agreement on when um, initial screening data should be obtained, and this likely varies just based on underlying etiology. The International Society for Clinical Densitometry recommends that in children with primary osteoporosis or risk factors for secondary osteoporosis, a screening DEXA should be obtained um, at the initial visit, whereas in children with chronic immobility or significant motor disability, you would obtain a DEXA based on their recommendations at the time of first fracture. Um, and then again, there's no clear guidance as to the frequency or duration of follow-up screening, um, and this is going to depend on a child's independent risk factors, um, how long those risk factors are going to be uh, present, or the specific disease course. So, for instance, we see that um, those who are affected by anorexia nervosa oftentimes will have increased fracture risk um, and low BMD even for decades after the diagnosis has been made. Um, so they would require screening for much longer periods of time than a child with JIO who has remission of, of their disease once they're through um, puberty. Um, the one consent is that any child who's going to be started on medical therapy for osteoporosis should get a baseline DEXA um, prior to initiation of therapy. And we certainly shouldn't be, shouldn't be getting DEXAs more often than every six months, um, and that's because of concerns about um, excess radiation. So as far as therapeutics are concerned, um, the initial treatment is really directed at just reducing or el eliminating, if possible, modifiable risk factors. The goals of therapy include fracture prevention, scoliosis prevention, improved function and mobility, and then reduction in pain. Um, in this capacity, it's really important, again, to ensure daily intake of um, appropriate daily intake of calcium, normal vitamin D levels. If you have a child who's either obese or underweight, addressing that is going to be important. And then number one, um, really, is just reducing the activity of underlying disease that's causing osteoporosis. This is the most important thing that we can do. Now, sometimes this is actually going to require that children be treated with iatrogens like glucocorticoids. But the consensus is that the net benefit of reducing the inflammation um, of an under, like an underlying inflammatory condition, the improved mobility, reduction in malabsorption that may be present in a child, all of these benefits probably outweigh the adverse drug effect that the therapy might have on the bones. Um, and then, of course, the role of PT um, shouldn't be overlooked. Kids should probably be started in PT um, if they're at risk for osteoporosis as early as possible. And we see that modest increases in skeletal loading can actually um, cause a pretty significant gain in bone mass. As far as medical therapies are concerned, um, bisphosphonates are the most widely studied agents used to treat osteoporosis in children. Um, we've been using them for probably a little bit over 30 years now, um, but in spite of that, they do remain an off-label indication for um, the treatment of osteoporosis in children. So what bisphosphonates are, are synthetic analogs of pyrophosphate, which is an endogenous regulator of bone metabolism. And what we see in bisphosphonates, um, if you look at this picture here in the right corner, the bottom molecule is actually a bisphosphonate molecule, and the top molecule is um, pyrophosphate. And so in bisphosphonates, the central oxygen of pyrophosphate is replaced by a carbon molecule, which renders the enzyme uh, resistant to enzymatic hydrolysis. Um, and then there are two side chains called R1 and R2. And the newer bisphosphonates, the R2 contains nitrogen. Um, and this is something that really enhances the potency of the drugs. And so most of the commonly used bisphosphonates today, like pimidronate, valendronate, um, alendronate are all nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates. And the way that um, bisphosphonates work in osteoporosis is that they induce osteoclastic apoptosis, which thereby provides an anti-resorptive effect. Overall, the medication is very poorly absorbed in humans. So in nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates, less than 1% of the medication is actually absorbed, with the remainder of it being excreted in the urine. Um, and it's important to note that bisphosphonates bind to, to bone homogeneously, but rather they preferentially bind to bone with a high turnover rate, which makes sense when you think about the fact that they're, they're being taken up by osteoclasts. Um, 
So bisphosphonates are used very frequently in adults with osteoporosis, but, um, and I'm sure you guys have recognized that this is a theme right now, at present, there's no consensus on the use of bisphosphonates to treat osteoporosis in children. The reason for that is that we just have a paucity of, of data. To date, most of the intervention studies that have been done in children have been limited to case series or small observational or case control studies that maybe have historical controls. Um, there are a few controlled studies, but there are very few of them, and all of them are um, insufficiently powered. Most centers just don't really have um, enough patients with any particular disease process to, to, be able, to be able to mount independently a sufficiently powered study, but it's always difficult to come by funding um, for a multi-center study. So we sort of have to do the best we can with what we have. By and far, pomidronate is the most studied bisphosphonate in the pediatric population. Um, the vast majority of studies that have been completed in children with osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, at present, there's insufficient data to recommend using bisphosphonates for primary prevention of fragility fractures, and so we still focus really on a lot of the supportive and non-invasive therapies that we were talking about in the previous slides. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that not every child who has a chronic illness um, and has risk factors for osteoporosis or even a child with symptomatic osteoporosis necessarily requires bisphosphonate therapy. So um, again, it's really going to depend on what exactly a child's underlying risk factors are, what their specific clinical presentation is, do they have vertebral fractures or not, um, how often, how frequently are they fracturing, how long are they going to have these risk factors, is it really going to be just for a brief period of time. Um, and in general, we reserve the use of bisphosphonates for children who have low trauma, long bone fractures, or vertebral fractures, and osteoporotic risk factors, which are likely to be unremitting. So, you know, this is probably children most often who have severe osteogenesis ecta, or children with immobility and repeated fracture, and you know that, you know, these risk factors are not, are not going to remit over time. So this is a picture of sort of the classic dosing schema that was used for pomidronate, um, mostly to treat osteogenesis imperfecta. So all children um, using on this dosing schema were receiving, were receiving about nine milligrams per kilo per year of pomidronate, which was given um, basically infusions given in three consecutive days every two to four months, depending on a, on, um, a child's age. More recently, we've been trying to move towards um, using the lowest effective dose of pomidronate to treat um, osteoporosis. So again, this depends a little bit on, on a specific provider's preference. So you might start at nine milligrams per kilo per year and then decrease the dose um, over time uh, if there's good risk, or maybe you start at a lower dose and titrate up to the, least, the lowest possible dose that you can use. More recently, a lot of providers have also moved towards using zolendronate, which is much more potent than plimidronate, and so it can be dosed um, less frequently, once every six months, and you can give it over only 30 minutes compared to um, three to four hours for plimidronate. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data um, that, or a lot of studies that directly compare plimidronate and zolendronate sort of head-to-head -head in terms of how, um, in terms of their efficacy, but what little data we do have does seem to support that zolendronate is at least as good as zolendronate in increasing bone um, mineral density at the lumbar spine um, and then in reducing fracture risk at least over a 12-month period. There are oral bisphosphonates that are available and they're used frequently in adults, um, but the data in children seems to suggest that um, oral bisphosphonates are not as effective as IV bisphosphonates in improving vertebral height um, and just improving vertebral disease in general. So currently, most providers will still uh, give IV bisphosphonates to children with osteoporosis. So for a child on therapy, typically we would monitor for um, new fractures, assess for any back or bone pain, um, and then we follow BMD um, at least on a yearly basis. There's no consensus for the duration of bisphosphonate therapy um, at present, but the, the expert consensus seems to be that in children who are, um, who have uh, unremitting risk factors for osteoporosis and 
who are still growing that therapy should really be continued at least until linear growth is completed. For children who have resolution of risk factors for secondary osteoporosis prior to growth cessation, it would be completely acceptable to discontinue bisphosphonate therapy once you know those risk factors have remitted and then a patient is fracture free for anywhere from six to 12 months. There are some adverse events that can be associated with bisphosphonates. Um, so the most common would be an acute phase reaction with fever, vomiting, sometimes rash. This is seen most frequently during the first exposure to IV bisphosphonates um, and generally doesn't recur with subsequent infusions, but pre-treating treating with antipyretics um, or um, hydrocortisone Benadryl is oftentimes beneficial. Because bisphosphonates act to, um, to to inhibit osteofunction, we can see mild hypocalcemia associated with their use. This too is more pronounced after the first infusion with IV bisphosphonates, but it can occur really even with subsequent infusions. Um, and things that can be done to mitigate the hypocalcemia would be to ensure adequate vitamin D levels. Um, and then oftentimes providers nowadays will give a lower first dose, um, a lower dose bisphosphonate for the very first infusion. Um, Delayed healing of osteotomy sites um, has been noted in children being treated with bisphosphonates. So currently any child receiving therapy with BPs who is having an osteotomy should not receive bisphosphonate infusions either for the week before their planned surgery or for four months afterwards in order to ensure appropriate healing. Osteonecrosis of the jaw is one of the most severe complications of bisphosphonates and it's been described in adults. But fortunately, um, no pediatric cases have been described in children with osteoporosis or, or, or osteogenesis imperfecta. But nevertheless, the recommendation is just that, um, if possible, children should complete any invasive dental um, surgeries or repairs prior to starting infusions. Um, and it's important to have regular follow-up with, with a dentist while on therapy. So I wanted to time to talk about osteogenesis imperfecta. This man is Atticus Schaefer and he's an actor who's actually affected by osteogenesis, osteogenesis imperfecta and so he's been on multiple television shows and that's what um, OI itself is a clinically heterogeneous heritable disorder. It's characterized by increased bone fragility with a predisposition to fractures, low bone mass, bone deformities, and short stature. Um, there are highly variable presentations and a spectrum of severity that's present in osteogenesis imperfecta and affects about one in every 10,000 to one in every 20,000 live births. Um, there are extra skeletal manifestations of this condition that we're going to talk about moving forward. Um, so osteogenesis imperfecta again has actually been identified throughout history. Um, the earliest case reports in the literature began in the 1600s um, and then in 1909 Silence et al actually published a which categorized OI to four major categories. Um, and this um, categorization or the schema is still the most widely used uh, today for classification of OI. Um, and this is an infant. Um, it's actually uh, an Egyptian mummy that was circa 1000 BC, thought originally to be a monkey, but was later identified as the skeleton of a child with osteogenesis imperfecta. So in 1983, Chu et al. described an internal deletion in a collagen gene implicated in osteogenesis imperfecta. 90% uh, of cases of OI are caused by an autosomal dominant mutation in genes encoding type 1 collagen, and specifically the COL1A1 and COL1A2 genes, which encode, uh, encode for um, the chains that are involved in um, forming the, the triple helix of the collagen molecule. To date, about 1,500 um, mutations have been identified that cause OI, and again, 90% of them um, have been either COL1A1 or COL2. Um, just given the sheer number of mutations that have been identified, it's been very difficult to um, come up with the genotype-phenotype correlations for individual genetic mutations. So the collagen molecule is a rigid, rod-shaped, insolu insoluble molecule that's made up of two alpha and one alpha-2 chains. And these three chains form a triple helix that are held together by inner chains by sulfide bonds. Um, and then the molecule
called it has a repeating triplets of amino acids with a glycine at every third position. Now, because glycine is the sole amino acid out there, any substitution that occurs for glycine is going to disrupt the heal structure of the collagen molecule and, and cause osteogenesis. In Over the past about 10 to 15 years, we've seen a number of non Homogenous OI causing mutations uh, that have been discovered, um, and the vast majority of these um, will cause recessive forms of osteogenesis imperfecta. You can see in this table just a list of several of the genes that have been identified outside of COL1A1 and A2 that cause OI. So, briefly talking about the salon classification of OI, uh, there are four types. Type 1 is the mildest form. It's caused by a quantitative as opposed to a qualitative type 1 collagen defect. Those with OI type 1 have a variable fracture risk, um, but they can have scar bowing, they can have some mild scoliosis, um, and though they typically have normal stature, they're oftentimes shorter than would be expected for their genetic background and their kind of expected midparental height. Um, the risk of fracture decreases after puberty. Um, those with type 2 or type 2 OI is the most severe form or the perinatal lethal form. Um, it's very severe, so there are anomalies present at birth, repeated ribs, compressed or crumpled femurs, marked long bone deformity. Um, diagnosis is very poor, and mortality is generally associated with pulmonary hypoplasia or failure. Type 3 OI is the most severe form in surviving patients. So again, fractures are often present at birth. Um, there's markedly decreased stature, triangular facies, dentinogenesis and perfecta may be seen in about 40 to 80 percent of children who have type 3 or type 4 uh, OI. Um, and they also have pulmonary disease, though not quite as severe as children with type 2 OI. Type 4 um, is sort of a moderate to severe form of OI. It is milder than type 3. Kids typically don't fracture until they begin walking. Um, they do have short stature, um, which is moderate to severe, and there can also be mild to moderate scoliosis. So again, this just demonstrates some of the features that we would see <clears throat> in a, ch a child with OI. You can see the blue sclera, dentinogenesis and perfecta. Um, the top left is a child with type 3 um, osteogenesis and perfecta, and you can see despite um, the young age of this child, there are already obvious bony abnormalities. Um, and then um, this uh, picture of the, of, the, of the knee here, and a child with severe osteogenesis and perfecta who has uh, popcorn calcifications, which are essentially just um, happen because of disruptions at the, at the growth plate. So we talked about there being extra skeletal manifestations. This includes hearing loss, which can affect people with all the salon types of OI. Um, and can be either conductive or sensorineural in nature. Um, treatment for hearing loss um, in those with OI consists of either a uh, stap stapedectomy, which is a surgical procedure, or in those who have sensory neural loss, um, cochlear implants can, can sometimes be beneficial. Cardiac manifesta manifestations in include valvular disease, most commonly valvular regurgitation, um, aortic root dilatation has also been uh, described, and echoes often will reveal there's some impaired diastolic function, which is thought to be due to just um, increased stiffness of the myocardium. Dentinogenesis imperfecta, again, affects about 40 to 80 percent of uh, children with type 3 or type 4 um, OI. Um, you can have teeth that are either opalescent gray or yellowish brown, um, and DI really results are in um, high incidence of malocclusion, impaction of the teeth, and delayed and accelerated tooth eruption. We've still, uh, spoken already about the pulmonary manifestations. So taking a minute to talk specifically about bisphosphonates and OI, um, our early studies, observational studies, were very, very promising and demonstrated not only increase in area of bone mineral density, but also significant decreases in fracture risk, as well as um, in um, bone pain. But unfortunately, um, control trials and meta-analyses have mostly been equivocal. 
Um, so we certainly do see improved vertebral ge geometry and increases in total body area bone mineral density, as well as lumbar spine bone mineral density. Um, and we certainly see that the cortex, the cortical bone, um, becomes much more thickened with bisphosphonate therapy. Um, but no control trial to date has demonstrated a decreased incidence in long bone fracture, um, any delay in, any, in initiation or progression of scoliosis, um, or really um, improvements in self-reported pain. So again, there have been anecdotal reports of pronounced decreases in pain, but this hasn't been demonstrated in control trials. And the same holds true for the effect on mobility, activity, and ADL. Um, but still, um, we, we do tend to use this therapy because it's the best that we have right now. And this is just a picture that demonstrates the marked increase in cortical bone thickness in a child who has been treated with bisphosphonates, child with osteogenesis imperfecta who has been treated with um, bisphosphonate therapy. So the mainstays of therapy um, remain really orthopedic surgery, um, especially in children who have severe forms, um, who fracture either at birth or in the early stages of infancy. Usually bisphosphonate or medical therapy is insufficient to really restore mobility. Um, and so um, they oftentimes will require either osteotomies um, or placement of intramedullary rods to be able to have uh, improved quality of life and improved mobility. Complications of the surgery include either rod migration or non-union of the osteotomies, which again can occur if um, bisphosphonates are continued to be infused in the four months following the surgery. OI-related scoliosis doesn't really respond very well to, to bracing, but there has been some uh, success with use of halo traction followed by spine stabilization. And then again, uh, physical therapy and rehabilitation um, is a cornerstone of treatment for these children with the goal being to maximize gross motor function and daily um, activities of daily living. It's important to note that the PT should be individualized, um, so dependent on a child's um, individual um, capacity and abilities at any given point in time. There are a few emerging therapies out there. <clears throat> Denosumab, um, which is a rank ligand inhibitor, which also acts to uh, as an anti-resorptive agent, has been used in some children with type 6 OI, which tends to respond very poorly to bisphosphonate. Um, there is not much data available on the use of denosumab, um, and so mostly it's been used um, as a compassionate therapy. But what little data we have did seem to support um, that tenosumab increases BMD and mobility, though it had no clear effect on longitudinal growth. And then teriparatide is a recombinant human PTH level. Um, it has shown beneficial effects on BMD in adults, but there's not really much evidence even in adults to determine whether it's any fracture on uh, effects on fracture risk. And we don't use it in children due to a black box warning and risk for osteosarcoma. So in summary, it is imperative that medical practitioners be cognizant of the risk factors for bone disease in children. Screening for bone disease in an at-risk child is an important part of a child's overall care. No primary preventive medical therapies are currently recommended, and non-invasive and supportive therapies as well as orthopedic intervention remain a mainstay of treatment. Bisphosphonates remain the most commonly utilized medical therapy for treatment of osteoporosis, but more controlled studies are needed to better understand available treatment modalities as well as to develop new ones. And that's it. So I apologize we went a little bit long, um, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Hi, this is Melissa. Hi. Um, I, I first 
Paul just wanted to commend you. This was a fantastic talk, um, a great overview um, of metabolic bone disease. I just want to put a plug in for um, remembering to consider physical abuse in babies and young children who present with fracture without a history of trauma. Um, while that certainly can be bone disease, and sometimes is, it can also be um, inflicted injury. And we actually see the vertebral compression fractures in some victims of abusive head trauma. Um, so our teams overlap uh, a little bit and we check for, um, for bone disease in any children uh, that we see with fracture. Thanks again. Thank you so much. And yes, that's a great point. I guess um, everybody have a great Friday. Thank you, Dr. Gundam, for that comprehensive overview. Um, I've included your email address in the chat, so if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to Dr. Gundam. That sounds great. Thank you.